Um, so I'm going to present a, a case um, of oh, lymphoma. And this is an oculoplastics orbit conference case uh, from uh, November that we had to postpone uh, due to running out of time. Uh, and this is a patient uh, that I saw in Dr. Patel's clinic, uh, actually in my uh, first year of residency. Um, so she's a 52-year-old female, and uh, she was first seen in 2006 and noted to have right upper eyelid swelling. At that time, um, a biopsy was performed and demonstrated extranodal marginal zone lymphoma, and she was treated with external beam radiation. Uh, subsequently, uh, she, uh, in 2008, developed a left orbital mass, as well as a retroperitoneal mass, and at this time, uh, it was biopsied again, uh, demonstrated similar pathology, and she was treated with uh, rituximab. And then in 2013, uh, she noticed additional swelling up around the left eye and found that she had some uh, left upper eyelid edema and erythema, as well as a superior subconjunctival infiltrate. Um, so here's a photo from her second uh, presentation in 2008. Um, with the subconjunctival uh, infiltrate there. And then here are the photos from uh, 2013. Um, you can notice uh, maybe some fullness there. And then here's her, uh, you can definitely appreciate that there's um, a lot of uh, material under her conjunctiva. And uh, then we'll go to Dr. Davidson to go over the uh, imaging. And I pulled up the 2006 and 2008, as well as 2013, but I think I saved her more recent imaging for mm -hmm. the very end. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, for the imaging of contact hyperlymphoma, cross-sectional MR is really reserved for assessing the intraorbital symptoms because we don't see the really superficial masses. Well, obviously, it's something you need to feel the eyelid, and you can see pretty easily. This is a this is a T2 fat suppressed image. Um, it looks like there is a little bit of a signal um, in this orbit. This doesn't look like, look like a mass, and I think this was probably um, some fat suppression artifact, which we can commonly get depending on what's in a person's face. If they have a lot of dentition or um, done a work on one side, if they have orthodontia or something like that, you can get the whole side of the face can, can cause a distortion of the fat suppression. So you have to be a little careful about reading this. And if I remember right, at this time it was just this little bit of stuff on the right, is that correct? Yes. And so it looks like what we have is an isolated preceptal mass corresponding to what you saw. Lymphoma is a very cellular um, uh, neoplasm, so on T2 it tends to be darker than a lot of other pathology. So the kind of things that are dark on T2 that are, or their pathology are cellular tumors, like lymphoma, and also if you have sclerotic uh, kind of inflammatory conditions, that will also be relatively dark on T2. Uh, we didn't see any uh, post extension. The lacrimal glands obviously are sweet spots for lymphoma, so we looked pretty closely at that. And other than that, uh, a pretty limited evaluation. At least we were able to confirm that there wasn't anything uh, post uh, post bulbar or intraorbital. Um, and then coming back at, I guess this is the, uh, the same time. So here we see uh, solid enhancing mass, uh, pretty typical of lymphoma. We, we describe lymphoma on aging as being plastic, meaning it likes to get into and ooze around and uh, infiltrate um, uh, amongst the, the anatomical structures, <clears throat> which is one of the reasons why part of the differential with um, <clears throat> lymphoma is always going to be something inflammatory or possibly granulomatous. Uh, again, you can see that there's the same, um, the same issue with the fat suppression on this side. Looks like it's, just, it's, it's been failed. The amount of thickening, and now in 2006, they, they didn't have any right, any left side of these, these, right? So this is where imaging, it's easy to look stupid um, if you don't know exactly what's going on clinically because you might be tempted to say, oh, look how thick that eyelid is, it was, but there wasn't anything there, so we have to be a little <coughs> careful. I, I tend not to uh, be too um, uh, definitive about 
about eyelid pathology on, on, on imaging. Um, she had this large retroperitoneal mass that was biopsied, and that was uh, part of her, uh, and she was treated for that as well, and she had some recurrent eye disease at that time. And then do you want to go, uh, go back to, go ahead and, uh, here? Actually, you can keep going. Okay. Yeah. So then, a, a, a few years later, uh, she was having disease on the other side. And now we can see, I think, probably pretty confidently that this is not merely thickening of the eyelid, that we actually have an enhancing mass that is, um, I guess from the point of view of imaging, we don't know if that's conjunctival or if it's eyelid. If you see air between the surface of the conjunctival and the eyelid, then you can tell which side the mass is on. <clears throat> but apart from that, um, this, could, this could just as easily be something that's infiltrated the eyelid itself uh, as opposed to the conjunctival, so you'll have to tell us about that. Again, we looked very closely at the lacrimal glands as a place where the bone likes to go. We didn't see anything there, so it seemed like it was pretty well isolated to uh, the content. And here we see uh, kind of a sagittal view showing that thickening on the eyelid and content. We didn't see anything big going right for a bulbar or postseptal. <clears throat> um, lymphoma is going to usually be fairly uh, hot on, on PET, uh, and in this case, uh, we do see that it does show uptake. I'm not sure that's all that specific uh, in, this is, in, in this instance. And the PET was probably more useful for looking at the rest of the body uh, anyway. Um, let's see, so the, that was from, from June now, a few months later in November. You can see that she uh, has responded. We still see some thickening that's a little abnormal, but it's quite a bit less than we saw before. And uh, we didn't see anything else that looked like it was uh, progression or, or uh, a recurrence. And the same thing on the pet, really uh, very little uptake in this um, eyelid thickening. And so it looks like that was a, 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 a favorable response. Okay? Right. Awesome. Yeah. Can you get those sagittal and axial images uh-huh. It, 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 is it, in fact, uh, I probably didn't have to do any special um, processing to get this. This is usually stored with, uh, uh, with the study. Usually we just see kind of on the imaging, the, the bone scan kind of. Yeah. Appearance, and then there's a black blob in the head. Area. Right. <laughs> yeah, so uh, one of the things about, about PET scans is when you look at it on, on, the, uh, on the PACs, there are probably... 15 or 20 different sequences. Sometimes you have to go all the way to the end of the list. And some of them look like black boxes that have nothing in them, but when you start to scroll through, you re realize that these are the, what they call the fused images. So it's got the CT data and then the PET data superimposed on it. And we'll, use, we'll almost always get the fused data in three planes, um, along with everything else. So you kind of have to go looking for it. Um, if you have faith that it's there, you can look until you find it. But it is sometimes with it, and we have the same problem with MR. There are so many sequences that are either preliminary or preparatory that all get dumped into packs uh, that by the time you get through them all, you think, you think you've seen everything, but there's actually more waiting at the end. So. Great. Okay, um, so next uh, question. Um, you discussed the uh, pathology. So um, she uh, had a biopsy uh, again in uh, early uh, 2004. So um, the surgical pathology showed um, a dense confluent lymphoid infiltrate with small or immediate sized monocytoid cells, um, basically consistent with the previous biopsy she had in previous years of marginal zone lymphoma. And they also did um, flow cytometry um, to help further characterize that. And again, that was consistent with the previous biopsy she had in her clinical history. And so this is our uh, low power h and stain um, of the biopsy. And really here, um, big thing to remember, first rule of pathology for Dr. Manlis is blue is bad, right? And that's really all we can see here is essentially all, um, all these blue cells. It's hard to really get any more information, um, except there's some uh, scattered areas of heme as well uh, mixed in with the blue cells. Same thing, a little higher power. We don't really get any uh, phenotypic 
um, information, just uh, a large confluent amount of, um, of blue cells. And then one thing to point out, um, you know, obviously high iron differential at this point, looking at this pathologically is, um, you know, something of lymphoid origin when you see all these small round blue cells. And so when we're looking at it at low power here, um, one thing we want to look at when we're thinking of lymphomas and other things of lymphoid origin is the organization of the tissue. And here there's really no organization, it's just a bunch of confluent cells. Um, there's no normal architecture, no lymphoid follicles um, that we would expect to see in like a normal lymph node biopsy. And so that's important for us to look at at low power here. And then at higher power, um, we can see clearly that these are lymphocytes. They're small, round, blue cells. They have very minimal cytoplasm. And then um, beyond that, looking at this, really that's gonna be the expertise of the hematopathologist. Um, they can look and say, oh, these have a more monocytoid appearance, or these look you know, more follicular. And they use that phenotypic information in addition to um, all the immunohistochemical stains and the flow cytometry to help determine exactly what type of lymphoma this is. Um, and it's important to know that um, it's not always exact. There's a lot of kind of crossover, and you can talk to some of the oncologists about this. Um, you know, it's not always 100% clear um, exactly what type of lymphoma it is. Um, but in this case, it was consistent with the Marginal <coughs> lymphoma, which was also consistent with her previous history. And so, um, again, what we talked about, so we look at the overall structure first. Um, and then one of the big things once we determine that it's of lymphoid origin, we want to say is there normal architecture or not. Here there was not, and so we're uh, very concerned that it is a neoplastic origin, so a lymphoma as opposed to like a reactive lymphocytic infiltrate. And so once we know that, we want to decide, um, is it truly clonal? So is this a single you know, neoplastic cell that's multiplied? And um, we can do this by a flow cytometry, which is what was done in this case. And so you do light chain restriction. We'll go over that a little bit. And then we want to determine if they're B cell, T cell, natural killer cells, and that's all um, some of the special stains they use and then use that pattern to determine exactly which cell type it is. And so it's just a diagram of um, how we do the light chain uh, restriction. And so you can see all the way on the right, um, the polyclonals are just gonna have um, a 50-50 mix of the light chains and the B cells. If you have a monoclonal, it's gonna be um, primarily one or the other. And I don't know what the exact percentage is, but in our case, it was essentially 98% kappa. And so it was pretty clear that this was a monoclonal neoplastic process as opposed to something reactive. And this is just a control slide um, showing the CD20 positivity and I don't think it's important to really know the different stains, that's more for the heme path guys, but CD20 is a B cell marker. Um, and here in the control you can see how it forms those nice round follicles which is in contrast to our slide which is next where it's just this confluent infiltrate. Um, but you can see these are all pretty much CD20 positive. So that tells us it's B cell origin. And CD3 is a, a T cell stain. This is the control, again, showing some uh, scattered T cells around these uh, more normal follicles. And this is our patient, which just shows some scattered CD, CD3 positivity, which can be pretty normal, just some reactive T cells in addition to the um, actual neoplasm. Thank you. Um, so I'll just review uh, a few things about ocular uh, and nexal lymphomas. Um, so this is just uh, all the different uh, types of lymphomas, uh, T cell, uh, B cell is uh, more common in uh, the orbit and uh, conjunctiva and lacrimal gland and it's most often a non-Hodgkin um, lymphoma and the most common type of uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma in the ocular adnexa is uh, the marginal zone uh, lymphoma as this patient had. Uh, next most common is follicular and one of the less common types is mantle cell. Uh, these classifications uh, depend on the differentiation uh, of the cell of origin. Those um, B cells in their different stages of maturation kind of enter the, uh, the follicles and exit and that's uh, how that classification comes about. Um, so we talked about uh, the typical uh, pathologic uh, findings of uh, marginal zone lymphomas, uh, which is here. And then uh, we talked some about the differential diagnosis, a reactive hyperplasia, which would not be monoclonal, and um, the CD10 and CD5 um, on the flow cytometry helped in this case to distinguish uh, the K2 
case from the other types of lymphoma. Um, so a little bit about uh, the clinical presentation of uh, ocular adnexal uh, lymphomas. Um, so on average, patients have symptoms for about eight months before diagnosis. These tend to kind of grow slowly. Most of them present with a mass. Uh, pain and uh, systemic constitutional symptoms are uh, relatively rare. Uh, most often, the marginal zone lymphomas uh, are in the orbit, uh, but they're also uh, reasonably frequent in the conjunctiva. 10% uh, of them um, are bilateral. Um, the recommended uh, staging workup uh, includes uh, some blo blood work as well as uh, uh, CT, and uh, biopsy is recommended to establish uh, the diagnosis because it's necessary. Um, most of them are localized uh, to the um, ocular adnexa, 76%. Um, only 19% uh, uh, are uh, disseminated. Uh, some risk factors include uh, autoimmune diseases and uh, HIV. Um, so we mostly have, I've mostly been referring to these as marginal zone lymphomas. Um, so elsewhere in the body, uh, one type of uh, the most common type of marginal zone lymphoma is a malt lymphoma, and that's uh, classically associated uh, with H. pylori uh, in the gut, and it's thought to be um, uh, due to chronic inflammation from that uh, H. pylori infection, and it resolves with antibiotics. However, uh, in the eye, um, the prognosis is actually different uh, compared to uh, these uh, gastric uh, malt lymphomas and uh, it looks different on histology. So uh, most likely these marginal zone lymphomas are different from uh, malt lymphomas uh, elsewhere in the body. Some people have uh, hypothesized that the ocular marginal zone lymphomas could be reactive to some sort of ocular infection. Uh, and there was one publication that associated with uh, this uh, chlamydia, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that species, but um, with this type of chlamydia. Um, however, subsequent studies didn't really confirm that. Uh, so it's thought that, um, I think the evidence supports that these marginal zone lymphomas um, of the eye are different from malt lymphomas of the gut that can just be treated with antibiotics and are very unlikely to have systemic involvement. So um, does anyone know what's happening with the malt of the gut? So regarding treatment, uh, localized disease is usually treated uh, with radiation, uh, and disseminated disease is usually treated with chemotherapy. Um, rituximab uh, can be used as a single agent. Uh, this patient received uh, radiation when it was just in her right orbit, and then once she had it in her left orbit and her retroperitoneal area, then she got rituximab. Um, sometimes uh, these have been treated uh, with steroids, uh, with surgery only and uh, with observation. Uh, response to radiation uh, can be uh, pretty slow. Uh, in terms of the prognosis, uh, it's relatively good. Uh, overall survival at 10 years is 89%. Uh, Progression-free survival is 57%. Um, and death due to lymphoma at 10 years is uh, only 3%. Um, so after uh, the one orbit is radiated, the most common site of recurrence is the contralateral orbit, um, as occurred in our patient's case. And usually, the, uh, if the orbit was affected in one side, the other side orbit will be uh, affected. Um, and there is uh, this pro international prognostic index that can be used uh, to determine uh, the prognosis for an individual patient. Um, so for this patient, um, she, uh, uh, she still had those, uh, that uh, residual ocular disease and the retroperitoneal lesions. Although the ocular disease was uh, biopsied, uh, she was recommended to get rituximab, but then subsequently uh, did not follow up and get that. Uh, she uh, got imaging two years later, despite not having any chemotherapy, uh, both the uh, uh, 
conjunctival and the uh, retroperitoneal lesions had partially regressed. Um, she didn't follow up with uh, Dr. Patel, but she did see Dr. Mamelis, who's her anterior segment doctor, and uh, her conjunctiva and cornea uh, were grossly normal um, at that time. Uh, and this is just uh, some imaging from, uh, from more recently, just this past fall. I think it's pretty uh, benign. Um, but they did say uh, that there were multiple sites of you know, recurrent tumor, uh, including the superior aspect of left globe and the uh, left perirenal region. So a little bit about the natural history since this patient uh, regressed somewhat even though she didn't get any treatment. Um, even though these lesions are usually treated, uh, this one study was published um, on 36 patients who uh, declined treatment uh, or had reassuring uh, histopathology or their lesions were completely resected. Uh, two of these 36 patients uh, notably did die from their lymphoma, uh, and 17 uh, of them, about half of them, eventually did uh, progress, and 11 of those uh, were treated. Uh, but on average, uh, they didn't require treatment until about five years later, and 25 of them were still not treated um, even after seven years. Um, this other study was published uh, on eight patients who had uh, conjunctival lymphoma, and that was incompletely resected, and seven out of the eight lesions uh, spontaneously regressed. Um, so it has a you know, relatively benign natural history, but it still can um, be fatal in some cases, so it's probably a good idea to treat if the patient's willing to go for it. Um, questions, thoughts? Dr. Mamelis? You know, when you're looking at <clears throat> the association with systemic lymphoma, you've gotta be really careful to look at the study, how long the follow-up was. And Fred Jacobiak had a good group of, of patients with ocular lymphoma when he was in New York, and they had about a 25% incidence of systemic lymphoma associated with it at five years. But then he followed them. And at 10 years, it went up to 50%, and at 15 years, it was like almost two thirds. And so, depending on how long you follow them, there's more and more of a chance of systemic lymphoma showing up. So, you really want to keep a close eye on these people, but when you're looking at studies, you want to see how long the follow-up is because that is really going to depend on, on how many of the patients you'll see that have the disseminated or systemic lymphoma. The question for, I don't know if you may have mentioned this, but I don't know if it was Jacoby at Corpism, but we looked this out years ago. You'd think orbital lymphoma would be worse than conjunctiva, would be worse than I did. It's interesting, it's the opposite. It's based on those initial studies. I think lymphoma worse prognosis than conjunctiva, conjunctiva worse than normal. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting. I would have thought the orbital orbs would be more effective. I always assumed that there must be multi, these must be multicentered. There was a vogue in the 1990s and early 2000s just to inject them with steroids blindly. I, I'm not a big fan of that because you really don't know what you're doing. I'd much rather dissect these maximally because there have been these reports of Quite a few lymphoma patients refuse treatment, interestingly, I'm not sure why. Because localized radiation seems to melt them away pretty well if they're localized. But the eyelid ones are the ones you've got to be careful about. I mean, if you take this. Now, my question, too, to Dr. Patel's point about the, the eyelid versus the contact type, and I always kind of thought there was a type of those worse false prognosis for systemic dissemination. Uh, <coughs> yeah, I didn't. Uh, that here um, in the study, but yeah, there were some, there were some papers I looked at, but I can't recall at this moment which one which site was worse in terms of prognosis. And then generally, I think from the radiation perspective, we always feel like the orbital lymphomas are more responsive to radiation compared to um, like the marginal zone lymphomas of like the skin or the molds of the stomach. Um, but then again, it could just be because it's easier kind of some of the more superficial conjunctival lymphomas to see their clinical response um, than like, you know, the stomach. And then like a big question kind of in our field right now is whether to do like super low dose, like the boom boom two gray times two, which is just a total dose of four gray versus doing kind of more standard of 24 gray in 12 treatments. And like part of how we decide on that is like a lot of it has to do with like Not that 24 gray really has that many more side effects, but it can potentially 
junior years, going to the point of time, I did. That's a good point. No, generally, um, not really. <clears throat> we kind of lumped all of them together. I think that, in, in general, the kind of orbital sites on Punta Caiba and Islet are pretty sensitive. Thank you uh, for joining us. Oh, yeah. No, thank you. That's okay. So this um, is. Sorry, this, oh, yeah. uh, so I checked the reference that I had looked up, and it did uh, confirm what uh, Jacoby had found earlier that uh, Cochin Taiwan has the most benign prognosis, the least likelihood of systemic involvement, and I, I lit at the highest. So this is my fifth presentation so far this month, but I think some of the people in this room uh, kind of make me the most nervous out of all of those. So I'm going to talk kind of fast, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So this, is, this was kind of an interesting patient that I saw actually when I was in clinic with Dr. Patel last year. So she had come to us initially from um, outside hospital out of state. Um, around age 36, she began developing this kind of increasing prominence of her right eye. And it was kind of followed for what sounds like about a year and a half. Um, she got in with an oculoplastic surgeon uh, in her home state. and. Uh, initially underwent orbital decompression um, in 2008, and at that time was diagnosed with fibrous dysplasia per the outside reports. We didn't have any of the outside records, and actually in reviewing our stuff, it looks like de several people have tried to get hold of them as well and um, have been unsuccessful in getting those, but she eventually came to us about three years later in 2011. When we saw her at first, uh, she was doing quite well. Um, she was 20-20 in both eyes. She had no APD, full color place, but she did have uh, fairly significant right-sided proptosis. Um, her visual field testing showed mild enlargement of the blind spot on the right. Um, and then she also had a little bit of uh, fairly benign appearing superior optic nerve edema. So I'm showing you these pictures just because um, there wasn't a really better way to do it, but. Um, this was when we first saw her, and this was after uh, subsequent decompression surgery that she had. So it's hard to tell because I was trying to protect her identity a little bit, but it, it actually does look a little bit better. It's not quite as obvious here, but you can see the, the right-sided proptosis. Um, after she first got plugged in with us, she developed a kind of acute, subacute decrease of vision in the right eye. She'd been stable for a few visits, and then underwent kind of a semi-emergent right lateral orbitotomy and decompression in April of 2011. And then that specimen was actually sent for pathology. Um, at this time, I'd kind of like to just review the imaging, um, the images that we've got, if that's okay. So I'll get your stuff pulled up here. And then I put that other picture that you emailed me, um, is the very last one okay. on this. So, but. So for starters, uh, I just put up a soft tissue windowed image of a CT scan uh, showing that there is 
an obvious expans expansile, primarily what looks like looks to be an, uh, a bone based process. You have marked. So is there a laser on this in tune? So you can see that uh, there is this mark that can lateral orbital wall, a greater sphenoid, and even extending into the, the uh, central sphenoid. Uh, there's no obvious soft tissue mass either here or here. Now this is the non-contrast skin. This is, a, this is actually an interesting study in diagnostic imaging because um, we probably could have done better than we did in terms of, of using diagnostic imaging to, to help you figure out what's going on. There are a couple reasons why people came to the conclusion that they did early on. Um, but assessing for soft tissue whenever you see what looks to be you know, a, a process of growth is, is a big part of, of what we're looking for in, in the head and neck. Um, at this point, I think people kind of focused in on, well, what do, what do the bones look like? Which is, uh, I think, very telling in terms of, of what you think this might be. And uh, a, series <coughs> of, a series of images here from the level of maxillary sinus all the way up to uh, the, the upper central skull base, you can see that there is this fairly striking, somewhat homogeneous, expansile osseous process. And it's pretty solid. You, almost have, you have some little lobulations here at some parts of it. Um, this is the level of, of uh, frame rotunda right there. This is the level of the superior fissure. And you can see that even though it's open, eventually you might get some mass effect in this. This is involving uh, a broad region of the, the, the greater sphenoid wing lateral over the wall and the squamous portion of the temporal bone. And it's isolated, it seems to be just in that one location. A little higher up, now we're at the level of the optic chiasm. You can see that here's the optic canal here and here. Starting a little bit narrow, there is that expansile hyperostatic process surrounding <coughs> the optic canal. So this is going to be one of, your, one of your pressure points and one of the reasons why you're going to be thinking about, about intervening. And again, we see this Fairly um, dense hyperostosis, a little bit of lobulations. Uh, there's no real central lucency in this. There's no areas, uh, no, no, no pockets, no destruction, no lytic component. And a little, up a little bit higher, we can see this relatively homogeneous, solid process. Now, one of the things that we try to do in, in this is, is assess is this a dysplastic process or is this a reactive process? And it turns out, in this case, that sort of means everything. We're looking at this, this is a 36-year-old female. When you hear somebody say, skull base, expansile process, fibrous dysplasia. And what's the buzzword for fibrous dysplasia? Ground glass bone. So you look at this, is that kind of ground glass bone? Yeah, this is sort of ground glassy. Maybe the things about this that aren't as typical for fibrous dysplasia, these sort of lobulations aren't quite as normal. And you see how you have these, um, sort of bony excrescences, like these little, these little bits of, of bone that are growing off of the, of the periosteal surface. That's not typical of fibrous dysplasia. The other thing is, is there's absolutely no central areas of fibrovascular lucency. Usually in patients who have really active fibrous dysplasia, you will see pockets of lucency that represent these earlier active fibrovascular phase of kind of, kind of the growth phase. Now, you, you could look at this and say, well, she's 36, maybe this is burned out. It's mostly all the expansion, all the growth has kind of been done, and this is just a burned out um, manifestation of, of the dysplastic process. The other terminology you might use to describe this is hyperostosis, which is not a dysplastic process, it is a reactive process. And when you think about what gives you hyperostosis in this location, um, by far the most common thing is going to be meningioma. A meningioma is, is one of its hallmark imaging characteristics is induction of hyperostosis in the adjacent bone. Um, if you had a, a chronic osteomyelitis, you might get a uh, reactive bone like that. And I think at, at, at this point, the conclusion was kind of drawn, this, I, based on the, the, the imaging and the clinical, I think they sort of just landed on this as fibrous dysplasia. I think you got tagged as fibrous dysplasia. Uh, if you look at one of the early scans, one of the readers looked at this and said, uh, the primary differential is two things, fibrous dysplasia or meningioma. We would use the term in this case, intraosseous meningioma, meaning there's not a big intracranial component to the meningioma, but rather the growth is into the bone itself. And we will occasionally see meningiomas that do that. Instead of growing into the cranial cavity as like a, a, 
a mass protruding into the and displacing the brain, it actually grows into the bone primarily, and we use the term intraosseous in meningioma to describe that. Uh, Chris, Chris, can you get those bony excrescences that you pointed out with meningioma? Uh, I would say that those bony excrescences are typical of meningioma. Oh. Uh, if, you, if you look at uh, patients who don't have meningioma but, but are older and they have these sort of dura-reactive calcifications that are very normal, uh, think how often those things look like excrescences. You get a 70, 80-year-old patient with a head seeking that's otherwise normal, and you might see these, these little dural calcifications that look just like that, these little bony gross excrescences as sort of a more or less normal aging dural reaction with calcification. So I think that, I think that, that appearance maybe could have been a bit, a bit of a tip-off. And, and like right there too, these little excrescences. And then these right here, that would not be typical for fibrous dysplasia. So in the coronal plane we see uh, central sphenoid, greater wing, uh, lateral orbital wall, crowding at the apex as you go a little bit farther. Here's your optic canal. Remember we talked about it anatomy before, uh, optic strut, Planetary process defining the optic canal on this side, completely surrounded by this bony overgrowth. Uh, a few months later, she had a follow up. Hadn't really changed a whole lot, but again, uh, paying close attention to what's going on with that optic canal. Uh, a couple years later, June 2014, more of the same. This had, had grown a little bit, not strikingly, uh, but you had the same sort of solid hyperosotic bone uh, surrounding the optic canal. Uh, your foramen rotundum and vidian canal also could potentially be involved by this. Uh, this is, again is either going to be sort of maybe polyostotic fibrous dysplasia, but again everything appears to be in one locale. It's right there around the uh, the, uh, the sphenoid uh, wing, the uh, petroclival ridge, where meningiomas are really uh, well known to form. And then about this time, she was probably having some more vision problems, and so uh, uh, an MRI was obtained. Uh, we've talked before about how you look at MRIs as though you have a CT in your mind, so you, you kind of go back and forth. There's your CT, there's your MR, so you can see that that is where the optic nerve runs. Uh, you know, it looks like a reasonable amount of space there, fortunately, but we have this uh, very dense hyperosotic bone. If this were fibrous dysplasia that were had an any active component, you'd see little patchy areas of enhancement within it. And we didn't see that here. This is so dense that you don't even see any enhancement. This, this is a post-contrast T1. You can see that there's uh, enhancement of the vascular structures. And this is, you can tell that this is a T1 looking brain. So the osseous component of this is so overpowering in terms of the signal, you don't see any enhancement. Maybe, maybe a little bit right here, but if this were tumor, you know, what does tumor do? Tumor enhances. What does meningioma do? Meningioma enhances. It's really bright. So there is a competing process here <coughs> between the dark signal of the, of the hyperostosis and what is potentially a tumor uh, in the same location. Uh, series of images, T1 pre, T1 post. And now I think for the first time we get really suspicious that this is not virus dysplasia. So on, on the T1, you can see we have this expansile hyperostotic bone, uh, the mass effect on the orbit we've already talked about and why that's, why that's important surgically. But now look at the, uh, the postchondrous image. And this is really interesting. This, this is now 2014. And there may have been other, other images, but in terms of looking for soft tissue mass, this is the first set of pictures we have that show us what's potentially going on. And here we see a large, thick, plaque-like enhancement right along the anterior margin of the, uh, the, the temporal tip along the sphenoid wing and yeah, with, with, a, with a dural tail. When you see this, that looks like, well, now that, that's a meningioma with a big intraosseous extension and typical hyperostosis that we, that we see with meningioma. So at this point, I think um, we're sort of saying, well, now this, this is not fibrous dysplasia, this is definitely meningioma. But early on with the CT, I don't think, I don't think we really clued in on that very quickly and we didn't really ask for a, uh, an MRI, maybe we would have come to this conclusion sooner. And it may be that, that, that there were other discussions where people were aware of this, but in the, in the, in the record, it doesn't look like we were really uh, on, on board with this being an angioma uh, early on. And then she uh, went ahead and had a, a broad resection of this with some repair. And uh, here we see a portion of the roof, lateral orbit, 
and uh, some, some cranioplasty assist. You can see that uh, part of the sphenoid roof uh, was uncovered, it was uh, taken out to help uncover and uh, decompress that optic canal. And I had some follow-up uh, imaging here in, in January 2015. You can see a plaque-like enhancement along the medial uh, aspect of the middle fossa right along the cavernous sinus. That's a fairly typical look for meningioma. So there, there's some residual tumor right in there. And then I think we had another one a few months. Uh, uh, we see uh, on the axial. Uh, Post-surgically, we see this thick plaque-like enhancement along the anterior aspect of the cavernous sinus extending toward the orbital apex of the fissure. Now, so there's a little bit of residual tumor there. And I think in July um, 2015, looked pretty similar. There's probably some getting through that superior fissure in the orbit. We have some artifact here. Maybe a little bit of residual right there. And then um, February 2016, pretty similar. But again, it looks like we have some residual enhancement. Some of this could be granulation, so we have to keep an eye on it. Is it growing? This would be pretty typical for some residual uh, tumor. And this picture is to show you what fibrous dysplasia really does look like. Um, here is a, a good example of polyosotic fibrous dysplasia. It's not just along the dural surfaces. Our patient, pretty much you can see that where the dura was is, is where you were reducing the bone. Here you have polyostotic disease. You have these broad areas of multifocal expansion. Uh, and then you see these loosened areas of this fibrovascular uh, component. And when you give contrast with these, those areas really light up. On MR, these look really, they look really bizarre. They look like big, ugly, malignant processes. But it's just the, uh, the active fibrovascular phase of, of these areas of, of uh, active FD. So this is, and this is more typical of the ground glass appearance. You don't get that, you don't get the, that lobulation and that kind of bony crescents. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, it's hard to do these without kind of jumping too far ahead in time, but so we kind of saw, based on those last pictures, what the ultimate course for her was, but um, after her uh, second decompression, so she saw neuro-ophthalmology a few months later, and she was, again, doing quite well. She was 20-25 on the right. She didn't have an EPD at that time, and then she'd shown an improvement in her optic nerve edema. And then she was followed, you know, kind of every three months, every six months, um, until June of 2014, when she started having these transient uh, monocular blackouts in her right eye. And then those began to increase. Um, because of those vision changes, a repeat MRI was ordered. It was on July 2014. And those showed the changes concerning for meningioma. Um, and so she ultimately underwent an optic canal decompression in, uh, in October of 2014 with neurosurgery. Um, so, going the wrong way. So here is uh, the part for the pathology. I had an extra slide in here. So um, the specimen, this first uh, slide here displays the, the tumor itself. So it's a wing a spinoid um, meningioma. And so um, with this aerial view, it allows you to appreciate the tissue. Um, <clears throat> you can see that it's um, definitely hypercellular. Uh, there's compact, dense tissue here. Um, just a closer view. Uh, one thing that's unique about these uh, meningiomas is that it's similar to squamous cell uh, carcinomas in that you typically see whorls of cells. Um, that's characteristic here um, that you notice here. Uh, and um, I did. I did also want to note that that with with. Uh, with these meningiomas, uh, the World Health Organization has um, typically three categories for them. Um, so this category was on grade one. So there's grade one, grade two, and grade three. Grade one being benign. Um, so with this, you typically don't see any mitotic figures, and you don't see it here. 
typically see you don't see any areas of necrosis and it's not present here as well um <clears throat> and so with the grade one um subtype they typically have a seven to 25 percent reoccurrence rate um and in the other grades grade two um goes from 25 to 50 percent reoccurrence rate and then grade three is 50 percent to 94 percent reoccurrence rate <clears throat> uh So here, um, this is from Dr. Patel's um, sample. And so uh, this is when um, tissue was removed for decompression. Um, what you could appreciate uh, here is the bone, um, bony structures. Um, and then down here is the fibrosis, the fibrotic structures um, growing uh, around the bone. This tissue was decalcified. Um, however, there's still a large amount of bone that's present here. Um, What's important to note is that within the tissue, there was no uh, atypical osteoblasts, um, which is important because you wanna try to see if there's any um, signs of reoccurrence. Um, in terms of meningiomas, uh, for the most part, they generally um, don't uh, transform malignantly, uh, but if they, if they do, um, the dissemination is believed to be through the blood and uh, with the lung being the primary site. Uh, and so these are um, images from BCSC, just to kind of like uh, uh, pressure, um, to focus in on some key points. So with uh, this first sample up here, um, this is the optic nerve um, and you have um, the meningioma that is growing circumferentially around the optic nerve causing the uh, compression. Um, and then here we have, um, we have the optic nerve here. This is the, uh, the cancer itself, the meningioma, um, uh, originating from the arachnoid um, and then dura matter. And then here also you see that characteristic whirl-like pattern um, that's very similar to swim cell as well. Right. So, I kind of found this one interesting for a couple of reasons. One, just because of the difference in the pathology, um, just with kind of two two reported processes, and then also because we're getting close to OCAPs, it was kind of useful to be able to review all this stuff too while I was doing this. So, we had two path reports that showed fibrous dysplasia. So one from uh, 2008, or one reportedly from 2008, which showed fibrous dysplasia, and then another one in 2011. So in terms of fibrous dysplasia, it's divided up into monostatic and polyostatic. Um, so the, the majority, are, of 70 to 80 percent are uh, monostatic, so they're involving one bone. And then the remainder, 20 to 30 percent, are poly. Um, the polyostatic form is more likely to have skull involvement. Um, it's associated with Albright syndrome, so uh, the endocrine abnormalities, so you get uh, precocious puberty, um, they have the fibrous dysplasia, and then cafe au lait macules. Um, the frontal and sphenoid bones are the, the skull bones most commonly affected, um, and you can have optic foramen involvement in up to half of patients. Um, like so many of the orbital processes, proptosis is the most common finding, so, and then just the changes associated with that. In the past, it was previously felt to be self-limiting with the lack of progression following adolescence, so kind of burning out um, as, the, as the bones start to close. Um, but it's, this is kind of falling out of favor. This has been shown in older patients. Um, one of the papers I found from 1989 was uh, they didn't have any uh, histologic diagnosis, but they, were, they had this patient that looked like uh, fibrous dysplasia and ended up being meningioma. Um, on when they actually biopsied it. The, at first, they, they were saying that this was a fibrous dysplasia <coughs> transformed in meningioma, but their diagnosis of fibrous dysplasia was based on nothing, nothing uh, pathologic, and it was felt to be uh, meningioma later on, too, because the patient was past the typical age, and so they felt like it would have been too old to have fibrous dysplasia. Um, so it was pretty common to kind of have that, that opinion, but treatment's primarily surgical. And it's been reported that radiation can increase the risk of malignancy. Um, <clears throat> Sphenoorbital meningioma is uh, the other condition that we, we're seeing in this patient. So it's a high female preponderance, so greater than 80% of patients, so even higher than like with uh, 
with the optic nerve meningioma. And again, proptosis is the most common orbital sign. And up to 65% of these patients can develop vision changes. Um, and then for OCAPs, there's the association with neurofibromatosis type 2. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of just review these. So in F1, so the greater than 6 cafeolae macules, greater than 2 neurofibromas of any type, or uh, greater than 1 neuro plexiform neurofibroma, freckling in the axillary umbilical region, optic gliomas, the Lisch nodules, um, they get these distinctive osseous lesions such as sphenoid dysplasia, um, and then uh, family history. So that's NF1, and then NF2 is the bilateral acoustic uh, schwannomas, um, any of the two, so meningioma, glioma, neurofibroma, schwannoma, or uh, PSC, so uh, for OCAPs, uh, type 2 neurofibromatosis is PSC cataract. Let's see that on the practice questions a lot. Um, and then the additional criteria as well. So what the other kind of part that, like I said, that I found interesting was just we had a diagnosis of fibrous dysplasia um, based on the pathology here. And then on the uh, second resection, it was shown to be meningioma. Um, so it's been reported in, like, in numerous <coughs> papers over the years um, that it can be very difficult to distinguish between the two just based on imaging alone, like we saw, obviously. Um, and then it's been reported to transform spontaneously into sarcoma in less, usually less than 1% of cases. But it's also been reported to transform into fibromyxoma and meningioma in the past. Um, and then there's also reported association with formation of mucosal and then aneurysmal bone cyst. Um, and so actually that was, that was it. So there, there wasn't a lot of uh, stuff on the, the transformation of uh, meningioma. One of the papers was just kind of, uh, the, the pathologists were excited because it was it was in an area of fibrous bone dysplasia, but then it was also transformed into a very typical form of meningioma as well. But it's been documented um, in, in the literature too, so I thought that was kind of interesting just to have kind of these two, co these two conditions kind of come one after another. So, and that might account for some of the, potentially some of the imaging changes too, so. Well, what can be confusing with these is when you get the meningiomas, especially back on the sphenoid ridge, they can induce, you know, bony changes. And so the hard part is differentiating, is this a meningioma <coughs> inducing bony changes or the fibrous dysplasia with some funny things? And I don't know, that's really hard for me to tell the difference. Yeah, I, I, I kind of wonder is, was this always meningioma? Yeah. Because that's a question. Because we had the report of the path initially, mm -hmm. but then we didn't get the path in our hands until we had the so she became symptomatic in the early 20s, which is more like a fibrous display yeah. of age. You know, we, we don't see the meningioma until the 40s and 50s. You know, so it's easy to get sidetracked. There, there were two reports which talked about fibrous display of the meningioma. Mm -hmm. I, I don't buy that. I think it's probably like our case. And we will publish this and say, our oh, fibrous we've got two pathology reports of fibrous display so It became meningioma. I think you're right, this has been an injury all along. And then as it progresses, we start to sort of become, become suspicious and pick it up. In retrospect, I don't know what else we would have done differently. The age group was wrong, the symptomatology. What happens with the angiomas is you get a fibrotic chain that leads to a body edema. They just have a particular look. And this was more of a fibrous displacement look face with super orbital changes with no body change in the skin. So very, very unlike. That's a very clean, deep surface. Mm -hmm. Nothing to indicate that the body fluid which means the new genome. So again, it's just supposed to show don't believe your pathologist. Or your radio Did she have radiation along the way? Like, she didn't get radiation. Is that considered? I mean, probably her shipment in John is well, so, like, in most of the papers I saw that for the sphenoorbital uh, meningiomas, they didn't really talk about um, radiation for it. Uh, <laughs> most of the papers were really just kind of discussing timing for op uh, optic canal and roofing um, and then decompression. Uh, but I didn't really see, I couldn't find much on uh, radiation for it. I don't so know. we reserved that for unplug meningiomas because we have two or three patients right now where the tumor spreads along the dura. It's very difficult to certainly remove. Here we were able to remove a lot of the lateral wall, view of the whole canal, we reconstructed the orbital wolf. So she does have <coughs> positive proptosis. And she's really done very well. Uh, uh, she saw her recently, so did I. But 
division, uh, divisions come back to the brain. And there's no reason to give radiation unless there's recurrence and then people are hesitant to operate because of certain risks of operating in a reconstructed orbit in area, then we would consider giving so just a quick word, you know, the McCune Albright syndrome, which uh, Reese mentioned, is, uh, is precocious puberty, fibrous dysplasia, and capillary spots. And then um, neurofibromatosis can be associated with meningioma and capillary spots. And so Epicocious some people puberty. say that they're, sorry? Epicocious oh, I didn't know that. Neurofibromatosis, really? Uh, just, just the, the capillary spots associated with neurofibromatosis tend to be smoother, that smoother borders that's been like to the coast of California, whereas the capillary spots in the McCune Albright syndrome are more like, or kind of sharper, like the coast of Maine. <laughs> 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 A little difference in the capillary <laughs> Let's just study this for caps. <clears throat> All right.